I'm Marcy Crump. I'm from the Flywire. We're an urban media network here in Baltimore, and this is our 18th annual Baltimore Book Festival, one of my most favorite events. Today we have, you may all know, the book which was made into a movie. A lot of people, you know, you know the movie before you know the book. Um, I, I take it you must be good friends. Yes, yes. Or, yes okay, because I cannot imagine writing two books and not being good friends. We have Emma McLaughlin and Nicola Krause. They're the authors of the movie and the book, <laughs> The N Nanny Diaries, which was declared by Newsweek a phenomenon, the longest running hardcover bestseller of 2002, and was made into a major motion picture in 2007. Now they're here with another bestseller, New York Times bestseller. Well, you have numerous bestsellers, Citizen Girl, Dedication, Nanny Returns, and Between You and Me, and their latest novel is entitled The First Affair. We're gonna have them start with picking some selections. Would you like to hear a selection from it, or we can just talk about it? It's really your choice. Both. Both? Yeah. Okay, awesome, we will do a reading. Emma, do you want to tell a little bit about what it's about? Sure. <laughs> My mic is on. Yeah. Um, so the first affair is uh, is our eighth novel. Yes. Eighth. Eighth. Woo. Mm -hmm. um, and it is the story of young Jamie McAllister, who has just graduated from college about two weeks prior to when the story starts. And sh she's graduated into a dismal job market, which we all know too well and has applied for everything under the sun and nothing is coming through. And the one thing that comes through miraculously is an internship at the White House. And uh, Jamie comes into the White House as the lowest person on the totem pole. If you've ever interned or if you remember your first job, uh, it's pretty, pretty low on the totem pole. So she's basically making copies and making coffee when the one person to pay attention to her turns out to be the President of the United States. And he seduces her. The two of them come together, and this is the story of their first affair. And we will read a little selection to you. Um, at this juncture in the story, she uh, has run into Greg. Uh, the government has been on a shutdown uh, because the two, two parties could not come to a budget agreement. I wonder, wait. Switch mics. Is that, ooh. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the government was on shutdown because the two parties could not come to an agreement. Uh, might sound familiar. And during this unusual circumstance, everyone in the government has to go home except the interns. And so this gives her a really unusual window of access to Greg. And during the course of those five days, at one point, he kisses her. So that is, that, that, I think that brings you up to president speed. President Greg. President Greg, 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 Greg. He's just Greg to us, but yes, the President of the United States um, in a closet. Margaret had left a post-it on my desk, see me, and I immediately freaked, running through all the tasks I'd been assigned the previous week. I quadruple-checked the hotel reservations, emailed the confirmation numbers, gotten kosher meals arranged for the Hasidic Times reporters. So, Jamie. Margaret looked up from behind her buried desk. Yes? She nodded as if trying to remember what I was doing there. At least my oversight wasn't blinding. Yes, she repeated, lifting a finger in the air to detain me while she jogged her memory. For you, she swiped a laminated ID from her stack of folders. To ferry communications, requested by the Oval Office. I looked down at the words, full access, and heard my pulse swoosh in my ears. Why? How? She repositioned her mouse. Okay, she asked the screen. Yes. Oh, Jamie, she said sharply. I turned back in the doorway, a cold heat breaking. Did she know? Yes? We may have a position opening up, and I wanted to gauge your interest in staying on after. A paying position? I asked stupidly, dumbfounded. Until the revolution. Um, yes, of course, yes. Great. She returned to her email. We'll talk more. I have this fire to put out. Back at my desk, the plastic card clutched between my sweating hands. I felt like an invisible chorus was hitting its high note. A job, an actual job. 
okay, not in urban development and not in LA with Lena, but still a job. And in a year or maybe two, I could be positioned to really move to LA properly, get a used car and a mattress filled with more than air. I had to get it. I had to. I stared at the pass. He'd requested this? He'd requested me? The sparkler ignited, the heat of his grip, his fingers spreading across my back. Wait, wait, wait. I was misreading it. I had to be. An intern in each department must be given a pass to make deliveries. This was totally standard, and I was getting all worked up over, what is that? Brooke looked down with crossed arms. It's a, I know what it is. Why do you have it? She snatched it. What does she have? Todd bounded over with an exuberance not usually seen in anyone past puberty. We get all access? Hey, John. Todd leaned over John's computer. Sorry, man, but we get all access now? John thought for a moment as we all waited breathlessly. Grab me a Coke, Todd. Dismissing him, he pulled $2 from his wallet. Brooke slung the pass back to me. This is fucking bullshit, she muttered. Ignoring her sucked-in cheeks, I looked toward Margaret's office, expecting her to emerge momentarily with an errand. Nothing. I went to the ladies' room and gave my armpits a splashdown with paper towels and industrial pink hand soap. I chewed gum, pushing it over every tooth. I looked around the tiled room as if there might be a round brush and hairspray hiding somewhere. For the rest of the day, I whipped my head up every time Margaret came out, the other interns whipping theirs to me in turn. I typed things, scheduled things, emailed things. At eight o'clock, I raced home. I waxed things, bleached things, polished things. I tried on every combination of everything I'd brought to DC. My finger hung suspended over a billion dollars in lingerie charges. I managed not to succumb, if only because it would cost another billion dollars in shipping. I woke up an hour early to blow out my hair. And then I waited. For three straight days, I was Saturday night ready for 12 hours at a stretch. And here's what I learned about a suit that fits you perfectly. What at first zip feels like a reassuring sense of having your curves hugged, morphs on day four into the suffocating feeling that you're rolling in on yourself. I was no longer marveling at how this skirt showed my thighs so much as staving, gra staving off grabbing a plastic knife from the kitchenette and hacking at the center seam until I popped open like a pack of Pillsbury Crescent Rolls. And I was hungry from being too nervous waiting for the pending nothing to eat and tired from levitating over my mattress, waiting for the pending nothing to sleep. And then Margaret sent me on a delivery to the WHC office to get an approval form stamped, opposite of exclamation marks. I took the folder, reminding myself not to hang my head. I felt like an asshole, an asshole whose cheap, scratchy lace underwear had just chafed its way into a thorn crown of humiliation. I went upstairs to the appointed destination, two long hallways from the president, each urn and guard and grown up I passed, underscoring my naivete. As soon as I made the delivery, I went to the nearest lady's room, tugged off the assaulting thong and shoved it deep into the garbage. I was done. Jamie? Jerry pointed me to Margaret's door as soon as I returned to my desk. I looked at him questioningly, but he was back to his phone call. Oval Office? She handed another file off. I stood there dumbly. Jamie? Yes, sorry, yes. I took it and turned back to the stairs, one heel in front of the other. My mind blasted quiet. I arrived at his secretary's desk, the imposing everything around us making me feel like I'd imagined that he'd kissed me when I was just two rooms away. Had I? I mutely lifted the file to her. She smiled over her bifocals. You can go ahead in, dear. I managed to nod and walked past her to the open mahogany door. The midday sun was streaming through the windows. His desk chair was empty. Ah, Margaret sent you. I turned to see him coming from his washroom. His white sleeves rolled, the light catching the blonde hairs on his forearms. Yes, I... I raised the folder in front of my chest. Why don't you have a seat? Save you a round trip. He took it from me, inches away and then leaned back against the edge of his desk, sliding on his glasses. It was impossible to reconcile that this man, at utter, elegant ease here, had been hunched over and shaking. 
I perched on one of the two blue silk settees that faced each other. I was maybe five feet from him. He gazed at the documents. I crossed my legs, quickly wiped my palms on my skirt, and then clasped my hands. I remember thinking that I should say something, but the first dog spoke instead, growling to himself as he rolled over in his executive dog bed. My cousin had a Portuguese water dog when we were kids. My voice was too loud. Oh, they have insane energy. Yes, he took off his glasses. Did you know, I'm sure you know, but trainers recommend they wear these weighted jackets and carry bricks or bags of flour when they go for walks in order to tire them out? Maybe, given the panic attack, he had blacked out the entire encounter. I guess they're bred to be seriously hardworking. Maybe he didn't even remember it. Maybe ferrying his folder was just a general request that happened to fall to me. Sadly, no fish to herd into nets here. Isn't that crazy, herding fish into nets? How would that work, really? Do they bark at the water? It sounds like a synonym for a Sisyphean task. Why am I talking about this? I wanted to pass healthcare reform, but that would be like herding fish into nets, he said gamely. See? He smiled. It was a specific rope line smile. I crossed my legs tighter. I'm going to be a few minutes. He glanced at the open door to his secretary's office. No problem, <laughs> I mean, of course. Do you want something while you wait? His eyes held mine. My mouth went dry. He cleared his throat, laying the file on his desk. Water or a soda? Yes, a Coke, I managed. Please. He walked behind my couch through the doorway to the room where we had kissed, and I tightened one palm on the other as the grandfather clock ticked. The dog snored. It was taking a while, longer than it would take to go to a refrigerator and pull out a can. I turned and was totally unprepared to see him standing in the doorframe, his expression serious, set on me. He took a beckoning step back, his fingers at his sides, twitching as if he wore a holstered gun. I could see his secretary at her desk, but he remained intent so I crossed the carpet. He stepped against the wall, indicating I should pass, and I realized what we had been in the last time was actually a short hallway with four doors. One to the Oval Office, one to the dining room, one to his study, and the last one, toward which he was directing me, to a dim, windowless powder room. Within a breath, he was behind me. For the latecomers, for the latecomers, this novel is about an intern who encounters the desires of our president. And that is an excerpt from the book. The authors have created numerous bestsellers, New York Times, most famous for a Nanny Diaries, which was made into a movie. And they're here to answer your questions about the, the new novel, possibly how they decided to um, embark the partnership, and what their background is. I'm just putting out some feelers. Anyone that feels, um, yeah, raise your hand and we'll get the mic to you. When you were children, um, what books do you remember reading that really, like my favorite book of all time was Daddy Long Legs, which had this benefactor, this elusive person. And um, so I wondered what childhood books that you read influenced your story building now? We both met and shared a love of the book Benicula, uh, which our m parents had read to us and, and we just loved, loved, loved. And then there was the follow-up to Benicula, which was... Ooh. Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn. Um, but as a child, I remember the first book that had a real impact on me emotionally was The Secret Garden. Um, I, I think that because it, it, it's tinged with a bit of tragedy and mystery, and the idea of these children having to sort of fend for themselves emotionally and, and solve their own problems and, and heal their lives really resonated with me. And I think that we frequently put children in peril in our books, um, but we also write similarly precocious children who are very curious about their, their lives and their world. So I think if, if any book sort of had that, that first profound impact. But I also read Roller Skates that year, and I can't say that, that I loved it, but I don't know that that <laughs> changed my voice in any respect, although that is a great book if you've never read it. 
I, uh, the, the real beginning reading experience that I remember uh, having a real impact on me was reading Gone with the Wind in sixth grade. And I read it for all of sixth grade. I read it in my desk for every math class, um, <laughs> as my grades will attest. Um, I made a, a Scarlett O'Hara apple doll. Um, I did the whole thing. And now I'm so delighted because we live in New York, and my son's best friend in, in New York, this is a city, this is random, is a kid named Rhett, uh, who lives next door. They're not Southern, no uh, relation at all. And of course, now that I'm an adult and know the politics of that book, it's mortifying. Um, but the idea of this woman, this really strong, narcissistic woman, saying, saying as God is my witness, I will make it this way. I will bend the world to my will, despite a, despite a civil war. Um, and, and then that ending, which I think in, in is sort of is something I see in all of our endings, the idea that to end with standing up and saying, all right, tomorrow's another day. It's such a modern, I think it feels like such a modern thing that, that it, in, the, in the face of war and burning buildings and death and destruction and property loss and everything else um, and slavery, that, the, that the, this novel could conclude with that thought just that life, life can go on. But, um, I think that definitely has stayed. stayed it, it's, I see that in, in our thinking. Those are great questions. We all yeah, need to ponder was, what, thank you. what was our first book. What, what shifted our interest in books? I was in love with books. I, I was told that I was going to be a social misfit because I'd rather read than play, but I like to do both. I know how to do and I thank God for phones that you can read, Kindle, and all that good stuff. I get to read all the time. Any other questions? Let's, any um, aspiring authors or authors in the audience or just... Okay. Reading your books, like, I would never be able to tell that there's two of you. And I'm just wondering how you collaborate and how you kind of make that one voice in your office. She just asked how the two of us create one work over and over. Do you want to talk a little bit about our... Fighting. Sure. Um, th first of all, thank you. We take that as a huge compliment. I'm going to use your mic. Oh, sure. Um, we take that as a huge compliment that that our that you can't tell who wrote what. And and I'm happy to share that neither can our husbands, neither can our mothers. Um, so it, even if you know us really, really well, in fact, just listening to that scene now, I've lost track of lines that I maybe wrote and maybe she wrote. Um, we stumbled on a process with our first novel with Nanny Diaries and it's actually hung through all these th 13, almost 14 years. Um, and that is that we, we come upon an idea uh, that something's sort of happening, usually in the media, it's something that is getting a lot of discussion and we get hooked on an aspect of it that we feel like is not being talked about. Um, and we get kind of fixated on that. With the Nanny Diaries, the inspiration came, we had certainly both been nannies in college, but it was about five years later and the, um, the economy was booming and there was all this new money all over and especially in New York City and a lot of very wealthy women were being interviewed and talking about how hard it is to find decent help. And we felt like there was a real voice missing from that story. Um, hence the Nanny Diaries. So we, we come upon an idea um, and then we outline the story together. Uh, we really flesh out as much as we possibly can flesh out about the, the story arcs and the A and the B plots and the sort of core psychology of every character and the pathologies and what's driving them and the traumas that they need to resolve, the catharsis we're getting to. Um, and once we have that mapped out, we break that up into chapters, the odds and the even chapters. Um, and Nikki and I will take odds or evens, and we will be writing due to deadlines. Unfortunately, we need to do that simultaneously, which is pretty nerve-wracking. So one of us will be writing ahead always, and one of us will be writing behind always. Um, and then once we have a first draft, we string it together, and we edit each other's chapters. And then from that point, we edit together for months and months until it's ripped out of our hands. That's amazing. I really want to know how did you guys connect because that formula in itself, I don't think anyone's heard of that. I'm not saying it hasn't happened because you see co-authors, but just the fact of writing ahead and behind at all times. I mean, when we first, when we wrote The Nanny Diaries, we actually alternated almost every other scene. But now because we, ha we come out with a new book every August, in order to be able to stay on track. We're also uh, adapting our third novel dedication into a musical. Uh, it's been 
optioned by the Araka group who did Wicked, and we're getting to write the libretto, so in addition to other projects that we're working on, so in order to stay on track, we, we go at that pace. But uh, for those of you who don't know, Dedication is the story of a young woman whose high school boyfriend just disappears uh, right before her prom, and he resurfaces a couple of years later as the biggest rock star on the planet, and every song that he is world famous for and has made a kajillion dollars off of is about her and their high school relationship. <laughs> and she finally gets a call at 30 that he is back in their hometown for the first time since the day he left, and she gets on a plane in her pajamas to say, enough is enough. <laughs> uh, and then the second chapter actually starts in sixth grade, so you see their whole relationship from sixth grade through senior year, and you see everything that happens in the present. Um, and now, they're gonna sing it. So yeah. it's, it's been really, really fun to work That's on that. That's remarkable. Nikki and I actually were at NYU together. Um, okay. We were taking a class together, but we kind of, we admired each other from afar. You know, there's that like, you know those crazy classes, some esoteric title, and there's just like one person that's making a lot of sense, and then everyone else is making no sense. Um, we, we both sort of felt the other was the one person making sense. And um, we didn't, but we didn't really get up the nerve to talk to each other, and it wasn't until we ran into each other in an ATM on 86th Street, which was like four neighborhoods away from where we went to school, and we started talking, and it turns out that we were both nannies, which at that time uh, was a lot more uncommon than it is now for college kids to also be nannying, because life's just getting more and more expensive, and we had so much in common. Um, so we, had, we became fast friends. I moved in with Nikki about two weeks later, and, um, and again, though, it wasn't, it wasn't for about five years till we actually started writing. We had no idea when we were nannies or when we first met that, that, <laughs> that we'd be sitting before you today. All right. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? All the way in the back. Do we ever have disagreements? Usually it's like a weapons choice. Um, <laughs> We, we had some on the train down here today. Um, it, it's, it's like any marriage, there's an evolution of trust. When we first wrote Nanny, ni neither of us had read a, written a book before. Um, we'd certainly never done it together, and so we each thought that we were the garter of the book. And the other person was the enemy, who was going to change an adjective and ruin everything. Um, and so we'd have these just knockdown drag outs about the silliest, I mean the silliest things, everything that was important, every, every major plot choice, all of that, complete agreement. Um, the color of Mrs. X's dress, to tears. And now one of us starts to be like, I think you're like, great, fine, go do it. Um, we just, we've done it for so long together and we, we just really trust that we both want the same thing, which is for the story to be as good as possible. And that ultimately when we do have disagreements, it's, it's always for the, for the best. Like, if I have to make my case, it forces me to realize that I might have this really great vision, but it hasn't made it onto the page yet. So sometimes in making my case to Emma, I will realize, oh, well, I, I need to add five more sentences or a whole nother, and then it, it will become clear. What I'm going for will become clear. Or in the process of making my case, I realize I don't have a case. And I have to be like, you're right, this should absolutely go. But it, I think every single part of our process is strengthened because we have to be explicit about what most writers just get to do on instinct. And the helpful part of that is I don't think we get too far off course before we realize that we're doing something that is not for the best of the book. I think the other thing, just even today, is it's, it's writing is such an intuitive process. It's, it's an internal process, usually. It's something you just sort of feel your way through. And we are collectively, maddeningly to us, in two separate bodies that can't actually just brain meld. <laughs> we are holding the entire novel in our heads, the parts we're not even conscious yet, the areas we know need to be worked on but we can't even articulate, this thing that you can't, most writers can't even articulate a sentence of, we're trying to collectively hold. So we're in a stage of editing our ninth novel right now, on the train here from Manhattan. In my bag. And there's, there's miles to go. And I see about, I see, I see maybe 60 of them, or 40 of them, Nikki, Nikki sees maybe 60 of them. They all need to be traveled. But both of us were like, it's my 60, it's my 40. This is what needs to get done. And the thing is, it's just, we're learning over the years. It's just, it, it, all, it all has to happen. 
So it's, it's such a gift. And we're so grateful just to have, I mean, the, the fact that you have, here's the thing, no matter what we disagree about, the book always gets better. And you have company, and you only have to write half of it. Oh, that's an, <laughs> so that's, you know. Now, I assume you do this full time, other than being parents, full time. And, and just hearing you say every August we write a new book, that is just systematic. I know people are like, I've tried to write a book for 20 years. I have a, uh, my father's a professional writer. He's never written a book. And he's always had, he has books. He just never finished. People have written books about him and his accounts, but he's never written a book. So I applaud you just for the fact that two people, two people can barely go to lunch every day and <laughs> not a long master and not, you said this will be the ninth book? Uh, the one that's in my bag right. behind this the stage the is the ninth, book. yes. And numerous New York Times bestsellers, not just published in nice and your family's proud, but the, the world really is receptive to what you bring. Um, that, that is very, very, very inspiring to anyone that is creative. You just have to have a formula and stick to it. And our advice to anyone who wants to write a book um, who's, or who's working on one, when we were writing The Nanny Diaries, Emma was working 60 hours a week, and she would sort of squeeze writing in around that. And, and you really can. I think a lot of people think that they need to quit their job and devote themselves to it full time. We had uh, dinner this week with Amor Towles, who wrote The Rules of Civility, which we think is one of the best books ever written. And he gave himself a challenge in the first draft of writing a chapter every week, because that's as much time as he had. And he said, I'm just going to do it. So we just believe in creating a schedule and sticking to it, and not to start, if you, if you sabotage yourself from the get-go by deciding that whatever time you're allotting to it isn't enough, then it won't be enough. So whatever time you have, decide that that is enough time and enjoy the time that you have. And we also say, don't put your editor hat on too soon. A lot of people, while they're generating, they start critiquing the work, and you'll just delete back to a blinking cursor if you do that. It's a creative process, and, and unlike other mediums, we have to make the paint, we have to make the clay. That's really the first step. So until you've generated, let's say 50, 100 pages, and you have something to start working with and restructuring, don't, don't start criticizing yourself, it's too early. That's, that's great advice, because I know anyone, even if you're writing a letter or email is so important, you tend to start, you'd be stuck because you want the perfect words rather than just ramble off and then... Yeah, like, get, you know, get the whole letter down and right. then go back to the beginning. Right. And ideally, give yourself a couple of days away from the letter and then go back to the beginning. We're great believers that time and perspective, it, you're looking at it with fresh eyes. Now, new guests, anyone have any questions? Um, they're just on tour for their book, The First Affair, which is about an intern at the White House. Um, we can just imagine how juicy this book is. It's juicy. <laughs> anyone, anyone else with questions? I must confess that I, I'm not familiar with your books, but um, I would like to know, how do you incorporate cultural diversity into your story? When we were writing Nanny Diaries, we were keenly aware and we were making the decision about who we wanted the protagonists to be because we certainly were, I, I didn't run into another white college educated nanny while I was doing the work. And we were aware that as bad as our experience was, we were still doing it from a position of extreme privilege. We ultimately decided though that in order for the book to be funny, that we would need to keep the character closer to ourselves, but then show all the women that she's working alongside and that the experience that they're receiving from their employers. So that was very important to us. Um, and then it, it really, do you want to speak about our other, our other books, how it sort of varies from book to book based on? I think it does. I mean, I, I think we, we do tend to write as inspired and through the lens of our experience um, and, and critiquing what we can be, we feel we can be experts in, um, which is through the lens of our eyes and our world. Um, and it is something we, we try to be conscious of and make sure that the characters are represented. I will say, that in general, our books, for the most part, are social satires. Um, and most of the characters that are not the protagonist are kind of assholes. Um, so we've tended to keep that to be, to be frank, a pretty white crew. Um, and it's, it's held up. Um, but it's, it is something we struggle with because we're writing from, through the lens of, of, of a certain demographic of society and trying to make that very real to who they're crossing paths with.
Any um, questions for our authors? Okay, right there. Um, how did, you had a, um, a pretty good background with your nanny book. Where did you get your information about your Washington book? I think what they have in common, all our, our protagonists ha share a DNA. And what they have in common is that they are the least powerful person in a very privileged room. And we're, we're incredibly curious about that dichotomy between a perceived environment, whether it's uh, our last novel was about being a, a, a starlet, um, being a child star who grows up and wants to stop supporting her parents who have made her work since she was seven years old. And so from the outside, you would look at that environment and think, well, there's absolutely nothing better. I mean, imagine getting to be someone of that magnitude of, of power and, and money, and, but she cries herself to sleep just like anyone else. And same thing with the idea of looking at someone inside the White House and looking at the pathology of Gregory Rutland, the president, and what are the demons that run him? What inspires someone who is, is this close to not only having a, a perfect presidential record, but a perfect historical record, and just chooses to explode all of that. Um, and so we wanted to sort of show that underbelly, very similar to people thinking, oh my gosh, I and mean, people used to say to me all the time, a nanny on Park Avenue, that must have been amazing, you must have been paid so well, no. You must have been treated so well, no. Um, so we just, we, we like sort of debu debunking those environments. I don't know why it's fun for us. <laughs> it works. <That's laughs> Eight novels and one more to go. All righty, any more questions? Uh, the length of your timeline from beginning to end. Uh, with our first couple novels we were writing, it was about a two-year process from conception of, I of idea to being on a bookshelf. And now we're on a book a, book a year. Um, so, so we write the first draft in a couple of months. We outline for about a month ahead of that. And then we have a few months to do rewrites. And, and there it is. We've gotten, I think we've gotten more efficient over time just because we've, over 14 years, or we've learned what the process is for the type of story that we want to tell. So, and funnily, we've learned if we want to go faster, we have to go slower, because I used to have a teacher who said, "There's never enough time to do it right the first time, but there's always enough time to go back and fix it." And so we've learned to write a better draft the first draft, and that will save us so much time down the road. But it's counterintuitive. Now, in the first draft, normally. Since it's a year process, you've mastered it to how long? About three months, three if months. we're uninterrupted, and that is a huge if. Um, we're also, we have a web series now, which we're so excited about. It's on a site called newyorknatives.com, and it's called The Writer's Block. And it's us doing this, uh, talking about all sorts of topics. You can email and suggest them, everything from why are politicians such weenies to why dirt is good for your kids. So we do that, and we're working on the musical, and we write the books, and we do work on television projects. We've done screenwriting. Um, so three months if we're left alone, which we never are. OK. Now that's a lot. And, and you said you had a three and a half year old. Yes. So what, what, what's the makeup of each of your household? So we can all say, ooh. <laughs> you mean how many kids do we yeah. have? Well, so far one only. But, one only. But uh, so you, you might not have to say, oh. Okay. But um, boy, it feels like a thousand. Okay. You know, uh, under five years old is yeah. it's a twenty four seven right yeah. thing. All right. My daughter has also adopted a stuffed bear who is now a full time job. Okay. <laughs> so young mothers, but you, you guys known each other for a while. So when you do have a partner. No matter what, it does seem a, a, yes. a little more co courageous to encounter mm -hmm. all the elements in the. We support for sure. I, I I would have never. I know for a fact. I'll go to my grave. I never would have written eight novels by myself. I never would have mm -hmm. written one. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're really lucky to have each other for to make deadlines. It's a built-in structure. Um, it's sort of the way people, I guess, have writing groups. Mm -hmm. um, only only her mortgage is dependent on me not getting off of YouTube and writing the scene. <laughs> so it, it works. Right. Now, we're, uh, we have a few minutes left. Any other questions? I'm just curious what made you go back so long to write Nanny Returns after mm -hmm. so long? Um, why did it take so long for us to write Nanny Returns? And we do normally, we don't, we're not 
we don't write series, and we haven't had the opportunity yet, other than Nanny. Um, when we finished Nanny Diaries, I, I, I think we couldn't imagine at that time what, what the, we didn't feel like there was anything left to say about that community. Um, and then it, it, it was years later, and um, we both had sort of simultaneous aha moments within a period of weeks. And mine was, I was walking down the street and I suddenly thought to myself, what if a teenage Greer found that nanny cam video that nanny leaves? Um, and I and came to find her, and just the idea of that. Um, and I cried while writing the scene, and I cried while reading the scene. And, um, and that, then it sort of spun from there, and I think, the other thing that happened is in 2008, you know, the economy exploded, which was the opposite of what it had been doing when we were nannies. And, uh, and it was all these scandals, these Ponzi schemes, these, the, you know, the Madoff scandal. It was all these unbelievably wealthy Park Avenue living men who had grown up in that community in incredible wealth, who had now stripped the community of so much money and, and caused and wreaked such havoc. And everyone kept saying, how could they do this? How could they do this to their own people, to their own families, to their wives and their children and their parents? And we thought, well, that's, if you raise a child without any empathy, <laughs> if you raise a child at a complete distance from you, what do you, what, how is, what do you think this child's sense of connection and responsibility and community is going to be? Um, so it felt a good moment. We suddenly had a lot more to say about revisiting those childcare practices and, and what the end result was for all of us. So thank you and stay around, mingle a little, but don't go anywhere.